I'm Bob Crutchfield. I'm from the University of Washington, and I'll be talking about my work on, on employment, uh, labor markets, and crime. What I want to talk to you about today is less um, a, a presentation about a research project. You know, like here's the theory, here's the data, here's the test, here's the results. As much as I want to talk about sort of the growth and evolution of a project that includes. Um, several analyses, several publications, sort of to tell a story. As much I'll talk about uh, the story um, of how I came to this point of view as I will about the results. And the results are all sort of, you know, not grand tables or figures or any of those things. It's simply very simplified because in this book that I'm going for NYU Press, every time I, I submit a table to my editor, uh, she says, get that out of there. Uh, <laughs> and so I have to do things like turn regression results into um, bar graphs from, uh, you know, with uh, using uh, standardized coefficients and then just simply talk about what were the more uh, predictive variables and so that's what you're going to see. Uh, and, and, and I'm now wrestling with them because I have um, figures that show an interaction effect uh, and they don't like that word, uh, you know, so I have to find out how to deal with that. So, um, so bear with me with that uh, and, and I'll tell you this story. But I want to begin by uh, starting with Les Miserables, because I'm actually, another thing I'm debating with them about is the title of the book, and I want to call it Modern Miserables, uh, um, Labor Markets and Crime. Um, and if you know Les Mis, if you know Hugo's book, Les Miserables, you know that um, uh, this is the story of Jean Valjean, who uh, goes to prison initially because he uh, stole bread to feed his sister's starving children, uh, a noble act. Um, and then once in prison, he tries numerous times to escape. Uh, each time he's uh, unsuccessful in those escapes, he spends more time uh, in, in prison. And so he spends um, most of his adult life uh, locked away. And the story begins um, um, shortly, you know, just before his parole. And it's the story of his life on parole. Well, actually breaking parole. Um, and I start this by saying that uh, I characterize much of the discussion about um, work and crime, employment and crime, uh, is adhering to what I refer to as the Jean Valjean theory of criminology. And I say that because Valjean was this noble character stealing bread to feed his sister's starving children. And that's simply, that's the image we tend to have when we think about work and crime. We expect people to have been um, led to desperation because they don't have employment, and so they're engaged in a utilitarian action um, to, to, to find what they need, or at least to find what they want. So they're being like Jean Valjean. It's very utilitarian, very purposeful, very rational uh, in its, um, its direction. So I want you to keep the image of, of Jean Valjean in mind as, as, as we talk, because I think uh, the story of employment and crime is much bigger than, than that story. So let me start, really start, by talking about some of the stuff that motivated my thinking in this. Um, um, before I went to uh, graduate school, uh, in that time after um, um, receiving my BA when, when I, like many of us, uh, can't stand the thought of, of taking another exam or studying or any of those things, I worked as a year as a juvenile probation officer. Uh, and then, having been frustrated by that, and I was frustrated not by the kids I worked with, but by the parents. Uh, I had conditions on the kids, and I knew that I couldn't be successful in that job unless I could put conditions on the parents, and they wouldn't let me do that. So. Uh, when the opportunity got to uh, move to uh, the state parole board's uh, team, I, I took that. And so I spent two years working in adult parole um, and learned very quickly that I didn't belong there either. Uh, and when I left, my friends and co-workers said, you're running to hide in the ivory tower. And I looked at them and went, yeah, like, <laughs> of course I am. Uh, and I've been hiding since. Um, but I want to tell you about Walter as, uh, as a parolee that uh, I had on my adult caseload. Uh, the Hole in the Wall gang were a group of, was a burglary ring um, that I, of kids that I supervised as a, in, um, uh, when I was a, a juvenile PO. And then Robbie Weideman uh, is the brother of a very respected uh, writer, huh? John Edgar Weideman, who is also a professor of English uh, at uh, Brown University. Um, now, Walter, I should say, uh, I, I got him on um, my caseload. Not long after, you know, I was trained like many uh, young parole officers by given, being given a, a caseload of, of, of people who had been convicted of murder and were then paroled uh, because they were the easiest to um, supervise. And I actually liked my job when I had a bunch of murderers as caseload because they were no problem. But then when they shifted me to a, a standard caseload, one of my colleagues says, you'll like Walter. 
And Walter was a monumental pain in the neck. Uh, I first met him when I went to visit him, and he hadn't been working, and we had the conversation about, you gotta find a job, and he, uh, and he wouldn't. And so, um, so I finally motivated uh, Walter by telling him that if he didn't get a job, if he didn't apply for jobs, uh, every week he didn't apply, I was gonna lock him up for the weekend. Because uh, we had 48 hour war uh, warrants that it's a, it's his PO, I could just sign it and lock him up. And so he had to show up every day about midday at the parole office with a list of the places he'd applied for a job. <coughs> Uh, and if he didn't do that, he was going to spend the weekend in jail, which may sound terrible, but you know, he had a young wife who was expecting a child, and Walter's idea of, of what he should be doing was hanging out. Uh, and we knew, and even as early in my time uh, as a PO, I knew uh, that success on parole was in large measure tied to whether people had jobs. You know, the people who we tended to get work for tended to have a better chance of staying on the street than the people who didn't. Uh, Walter's initial crime was sort of economically motivated. Uh, not quite Jean Valjean, not nearly that noble. He and a friend were out drinking one night. Um, uh, they ran out of money. Um, they needed more money. They followed an older man out of, the, out of a bar, and uh, just down the street they mugged him, took his money, and went back to the same bar they'd been drinking in. Real rocket scientists they are. But the old man, needing help, retreated to the same bar he went to, he'd come from, where they called the police, and when the police came in, he says, yeah, those two over there, they locked up Walter, and they locked up his partner, uh, and then a few years later, uh, he ended up on my parole case. So the Hole in the Wall gang was this group of kids who were, as I said, were a burglary ring. But the fact of the matter is, when I met them, uh, I had to laugh. The Hole in the Wall gang is actually was the name given to a group of serious desperados uh, in, in, the, in the American West during the 19th century who hid out in an area of Wyoming called Hole in the Wall. That's the, the Hole in the Wall gang. They were bank robbers, they were train robbers. This group of kids were as far from Hole in the Wall gang as you could possibly imagine. The notion that them was a burglary was funny. What they would do is they'd do, they would live in a farming area, they would um, break into the outbuildings of farms and barns and hang out. You know, and be, be 14 and 15 year old boys. Uh, and they wouldn't hurt anything, they wouldn't destroy anything. It was just the process of breaking in. So to call them a breaker of ring was like, really? Um, so, so, so I want to mention them a little bit, but the critical thing about them is their parents were these sort of marginal people who um, didn't have much going for them economically, were sort of scratch farmers, not really making it in, in, in Western Pennsylvania, where I was working. Uh, and these kids weren't tied to school at all. You know, they just were bored by school, and nothing was happening at home. Robbie Wideman, on the other hand, is very bright uh, and like the fast lane. Uh, Robbie Wideman is now still doing a life sentence without the possibility of parole in a Pittsburgh penitentiary, while his brother is a, is a professor of Brown. John, the older brother, older by 10 years, wrote a book, Brothers and Keepers, which is an exploration of he and Robbie and all those things. Uh, they grew up 10 years apart, which means the community they grew up in uh, was very different. Their motivations were very different. Uh, and lots of things are different for them. Uh, and I'll come back to that at the end. But for, <coughs> to step down to the next up, Robbie Wideman engaged in his crime, which was uh, <coughs> ripping off, uh, an attempt to rip off a fence. He and, and two of his buddies uh, were going to make a deal with this fence to sell some stolen goods, and they were going to rip him off, uh, and they ended up killing him in the process, thus the, the felony murder. One of his rap partners, one of his partners in crime, uh, was a man named Cecil Rice, who was actually in my Boy Scout troop uh, uh, at one point. And that was in the Hill District of Pittsburgh, which is one of Pittsburgh's inner city neighborhoods where I grew up. Part of the motivation for me for this project was growing up in Pittsburgh. Because when I became a criminologist, one of the things that jumped out at me was looking at Pittsburgh's crime rate, which was compared to other cities like it, uh, significantly lower. Uh, and what's going on here was, was a question for me. Um, where I've come to now is in some ways influenced by Seattle's Central District and Rainier Valley. The Central District is the heart of the African American community in Seattle, and Rainier Valley is that stretch of Seattle uh, just south of there where uh, minority populations have been moving. I'll show you a map of that in a little bit because you know the first analysis was of, uh, of Seattle to, you know, of, of this work. So much of my thinking about this um, sort of grew out of th this background, uh, and when I first came to this project, which motivated me was a debate that was going on among criminologists about whether it was poverty or income inequality that, that, that uh, explained violent crime. Well, 
For starters, one thing that differentiates me from those who tested the Jean Valjean theory was I was more interested in violence than I was in, in property crimes. So it started off, how do you explain violence with this? And well, for, for, for um, Walter, it would explain it. Um, you know, robbery is a violent crime. But it wouldn't explain much violent crime to talk about um, you know, using the Jean Valjean theory. So I, I kept thinking about that and in, in income inequality. You think about one city in the US that tended to have a high crime rate was Miami. Uh, Miami is a, is a financial district, it's a tourist place, and many people actually refer to Miami as the capital of Central and South America because it's probably the financial capital of that region of the world, um, so much money goes through it. And so the workforce in Miami is people at the high end who work in finance, who work in business, and those who serve them. Great deal of income inequality. Contrast that with my Pittsburgh, which as a kid growing up was a steel town where uh, lots of good, solid, blue-collar jobs. And so rather than great income inequality, a more new, normally distributed income um, distribution uh, and employment distribution. And I thought there might be something in that, because the way all of us come to poverty or come to a circumstance where, where, where we have unequal income is because of the work we have. We all touch the economy through the jobs that we have. So, it began, as I said, with unemployment and crime, and the utilitarian explanation of, of crime and delinquency. People do this because they need money. Um, people steal other kids at Air Jordans or other fancy um, 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 athletic shoes because they can't afford them. Um, you know, those kind of things. But the problem is, when you looked at the, if you look at the, if you look at the literature on unemployment and crime, it's very inconsistent. It's very uneven. Um, some people found positive relationships between unemployment and crime. That's what we would expect. That's what the utilitarian explanation would expect. Um, others have found no relationship at all. You put unemployment rates in, or you put individual employment or not in. You know, some people found nothing. And still, others have found uh, a negative association. This was for, for, for at least for, for burglary. Uh, and using um, a routine activities approach, the argument for that negative association is that essentially when people are out of work, uh, they remain home, they spend more hours at home, uh, they are guardians against their own property, meaning it's less likely that they'll uh, be burglarized. And so, you know, again, remember I started out thinking I was going to have a nice little thesis, I was going to, you know, get some data, I was going to test it, all of a sudden it's all over the map, it's not that at all. So. Early on, I had to accept that it's going to be a much more complex relationship uh, than I expected, and I had to do a number of things. One is to think more theoretically uh, and, and less simply about what I was expecting. And other things I had to do were other complex things to look at. Like one was uh, John Hagen and separately Terry Thornberry and Christensen uh, looked and said, you know, one argument might be that there is an employment and crime relationship, but it's you know the causal direction that I was thinking was was backwards. Because one of the things that happens is when people engage in crime, their likelihood of sanction goes up, and their likelihood of sanctioning means that they'll be less competitive on the job market. People who, who engage in crime go to prison, they come out of prison with a record, they can't get jobs. And so maybe that's really what's going on. Uh, and along that same line is Diva Pager's work. I mean, her excellent work where she's done, uh, she's done uh, accounting kind of uh, you know, uh, experimental design studies uh, where she uh, takes uh, Confederates who are identical in every way except for, for two critical variables, um, criminal record and race. And she has white with and white without criminal record, black with and black without criminal record, uh, and compares them and finds that um, having that record uh, significantly inhibits a person's competitiveness on the job market. Uh, and so it's consistent with what Hagen, Thornberry, and Christensen have said, that essentially having that involvement makes it mess less likely um, um, that people will get jobs. But she also finds that race really complicates this, that story. Um, because what she finds in, her, in, in those audit studies, and it's good work, what she finds is that African Americans without a criminal record are less likely to get a second call back to an employer than a white person with a criminal record. So, so having the mark of African American is more damning than having the mark of Jean Valjean um, uh, for, for a white person. So it's, again, becoming a more complex story. And then, I, I, in, in trying to figure out how to deal with this, I, I actually went back in my head to graduate school. And by that I mean I went back to literature that I hadn't read in a very long time. 
And it wasn't in the criminological literature, but it was in the social stratification literature. And so in order to start really getting into this project, I started reading about work, started reading about employment, started reading about labor markets, stuff I'd seen before, but I hadn't read in quite a long time. I think that's a virtue of you know, somebody making you read widely uh, at, at, at some point uh, earlier in your career, because we tend to get more and more focused as we go along. So that sort of, you know, get that background is helpful because I wasn't completely no a complete novice when I went back to it. Um, but that area I went back to, uh, led me to labor market segmentation literature uh, and a whole dual labor market argument, which in some ways had fallen out of favor among people who study labor markets because it's too simplistic. Um, but I found it useful. And I found it useful because I could talk about, you know, when you read about labor market segmentation, they talk about two types of jobs. And one of the things they say characterizes modern economies um, is, is the degree to which uh, the labor market's divided into primary and secondary sector occupations. Um, uh, and Using that kind of, uh, of thinking helps explain why some people are persistently uh, you know, marginalized and, 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 and persistently disadvantaged um, uh, in, in life. Um, many minority people spend most of their careers in secondary sector jobs. Uh, so as you read that literature, uh, what jumps out at you is, as I'm reading um, you know, primary sector jobs, what are they? And I'm first thinking professional jobs, but it actually is more than that. Primary sector jobs pay well uh, they have job security, they have benefits, they have opportunities for promotion, uh, they have security. You know, so those blue collar jobs that I talked about is in Pittsburgh, uh, those steel worker jobs are classically primary sector jobs. It is the professions, it's medicine, it's law, it's a professor, it's all the that good stuff, but it's also being working in an auto factory, it's being a steel worker, it's all those good solid blue collar jobs. In the US, many of them were union jobs. Um, very much manufacturing jobs, good primary sector work. To be differentiated from uh, secondary sector work, which pays little, have fewer if any benefits, uh, no opportunities for promotion, uh, are very insecure, people are in and out of the labor market quite frequently. Uh, and you know, in one talk I called it uh, a Mick job, referring to McDonald's, so you'd have to do the since you call it Mackers here, I'm not quite sure, it doesn't flow quite as well, but you can work on that. Um, but anyway, you know, the, the MIC jobs are these secondary sector jobs that, that, that really don't give you a stake in conformity, something to build a life on. So as a criminologist reading this stuff, the thing that jumps straight into my mind is control theory. And the whole control theory notion is of why don't people engage in delinquency, why don't people engage in crime, they don't engage in delinquency or crime uh, when they have stakes in conformity, when they have something to bond to, when they have something to lose. So that primary sector job actually gives you something to lose. Secondary sector job gives you far less to lose. You know, quick example. Imagine two young men, any race or ethnicity, um, same age, same background, live right next door to each other, so no neighborhood effects. Um, one works in my town, Seattle, for Boeing aircraft. He's an entry level worker at Boeing, getting their lowest salary. Uh, and what's going to happen? is that person knows that if they put in enough time, get seniority, they can bid and they'll slowly move up and, and, and get better and better work at Boeing and they can build a life there. Right next door is his best friend who works at McDonald's. Okay, so some of their buddies come and knock on the first young man's door and says, hey, let's go out and get some drinks. And they're 19 years old uh, and in the States, drinking age is 21. I know that's really depressing for some. Um, <laughs> You know, so they're not going to be able to go out to a bar or a tavern. They're going to go out and get somebody to buy them beer or buy bad wine, and they're going to hide out somewhere you know, and, and drink it. Um, but the first one wants to go. The bowling worker wants to go. But he thinks about it for a moment. He's got a stake in conformity. He's got that job that's going to affect his lifestyle. It's going to affect his lifestyle, meaning that he has to be at work the next day. And he thinks, I can't show up for work hungover. So he wants to go. He tells them maybe this weekend, but this night he doesn't go. Simply, his job is helping to affect his lifestyle. They go next door and ask the second person, he too has to be at work at 7 the next morning. Except he works at Mackers. And he thinks about it for a moment and thinks, what happens if I show up hungover? I might get fired. What's he do then? He'll go across the hall, to, uh, the, the street to KFC, and he can get another dubious job there. You know, no loss. No stake in conformity. So what I'm suggesting here is work conditions lifestyle. And then when you go back to the second, you know, the dual labor market uh, literature, one of the things I found there was the effect of, of, of employment and employment sector on lifestyle in lots of different ways. Who your friends are, what your networks are, all of those things are affected by work. So my example is a simplification. 
but there's growing and good literature to talk about how you, you, where you are in the labor market helps affect much of your lifestyle and pattern of your life. So I use the, the labor market segmentation literature to begin building this argument. So what the argument goes is essentially, you know, the reason I argue that unemployment doesn't matter is because it's too narrow. Unemployment's a bureaucratic, it's a, it's a government sort of counting of who people, who's working uh, and who's not. Uh, but really the difference between being a secondary sector worker and an unemployed worker, is, it depends on the day. You know, secondary sector workers are in and out of the labor market all the time because of the inconsistency of their employment. So one of the things I thought they'd do is, is to not worry about unemployment, but think about labor market marginalization, which would be a combination of secondary sector work and unemployment. Uh, and so these are people who are marginal to the labor market. It's to be differentiated from people in primary sector jobs who, who tend to be uh, fairly consistently employed. Um, so I'm arguing that marginalization affects lifestyle, which affects crime. How does it affect crime? Uh, those young men, when they are out there drinking, I don't know what the equivalent is in Australia, but in the States it's Thunderbird or Mad Dog 2020, and she knows <laughs> Cincinnati people do the same thing on the same brown paper bag, or they're drinking, for those of you who like rap music, they're drinking 40s, uh, you, know, malt, you know, malt beverages. Uh, what they're doing is they're hiding out somewhere, and what you have there is with routine activities, um, our people would say, are, it's a clear opportunity for more crime. What do you have? You have motivated actors. You got young guys drinking bad booze, motivated actors. You have potential victims, who? Each other. You know, they're gonna drink and they're gonna have a good time. And at some point somebody's gonna say something that's gonna be interpreted as disparaging about somebody's mother, their girlfriend, uh, or they're gonna scuff somebody's shoes and they're gonna hit each other. You know, crime is gonna happen. Or you're gonna decide uh, at the end of your social evening of having a good time, you worked hard, you decided to go out and have some drinks, you have to stop past 7-Eleven on your way home to pick up some Cheetos or something uh, to nibble on once you're at home. And you're a potential victim as you go past where they're sort of being. And the other thing that's there is, you know, you know, in routine activity says motivated actors, potential victims, and lack of guardians. They're hiding for a reason. You know, so they can, they're not detected. So we have the perfect situation. So I'm not saying they go out to commit crime, but the pattern emerges. And you can do this with adults, with young adults. You know, where do they spend time? Bars and taverns and pool halls and places where people get drunk and fight and do those things. The lifestyle itself, I'm arguing, sort of frees people for lifestyles that may be crime to do so. The challenge then is labor markets and juvenile delinquency, and I'll come back to that, because as we all know, a great deal of crime actually occurs um, from juveniles. And, 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 and there's early literature that found that if essentially when kids worked, they were more likely to become delinquent. Uh, and I knew that, so I was like, eh. So, you know, when I began this, I just left delinquents out. Um, but I will come back, we'll bring them back in. So, my city, this is Seattle. Um, and, and, and I gotta tell you a little bit about the topography and all that, because it matters too. Here to the west is Puget Sound, the saltwater branch off the Pacific Ocean. This is the port in here. This is the CBD right here. On this side of the city, it's a freshwater lake, Lake Washington, uh, about 20, 30 miles long, about kilometers. Uh, uh, about its, its narrowest point, about um, five kilometers or so wide. Uh, Susanna actually lived up there and had to sort of drive across the floating bridges to get to the university, which is right about there, uh, coming in. Um, this is the central district that I told you about, of, you know, which is the heart of the African American community. As I said, CBD. This is the International District, which used to be Chinatown, uh, and this is the Rainier Valley. Okay. Uh, so, what you have here is, you know, I, I did this analysis using multiple regression, controlling for all the important things: um, the age structure of the community, the, um, uh, the marital status of people who are there, the educational uh, distribution of people, uh, and so, you know, this map. It's only to illustrate the pattern uh, that, that, that we're primarily interested in here. And the cross-hatching talks about the number of civilians not employed. And you can do this with males employed, you can do it with adult you know, males employed. Uh, and no matter how you do it, it comes out the same. And I've, you know, if, if, you, if you buy the book when it comes out, you'll see lots of different maps of different cities and it, it comes out the same. Crime rate, violent crime rate is indicated by the size of the dots. Okay, and so what you're saying here is if you control for CBD, uh, because CBD is very different in lots of ways, you know, lots of crime because of what happens, what goes on there, you know, uh, and few residents, and so it has an outsized and strange and not really appropriate crime rate. 
Um, but if you, get, if you control out that effect, what you find is a very strong relationship between um, labor market marginalization, remember the combination of unemployment and secondary sector work, and violent crime. Very consistent with what I argued. Now, the reason I mentioned topography is because right along here is a ridge. And so the properties on this side of the lake are view property, and they're high price. On this side of the lake, it's the Rainier Valley. And the Rainier Valley is one of Seattle's most, actually, it's one of the nation's most diverse. Um, right in here is, is a postal code, uh, which is, according to the Census Bureau, the most diverse postal code uh, in the United States. Uh, African Americans, Asian Americans, immigrants from Africa, immigrants from Asia, Mexican immigrants, um, it, it, you know, uh, quite a mix. But I don't think it's about that diversity that makes the difference with crime. <clears throat> I think it's about the low levels of employment. So one of the things you get with Seattle is you get this, this topographical plans where uh, things where people live near Lake Union or the bays, over here where there are views, and crime rates tend to drop as a result of that. But that also means that people are in close proximity, people who are marginalized are in close proximity uh, to people who are not. And much of Seattle's crime uh, uh, can be explained by patterns like this, but also by patterns of, demography, uh, uh, of geography. Uh, but it, it supported what I was doing in my first presentation of stuff like this was on the Seattle aggregate analysis. And uh, I made the presentation. And the first question was the question that all of you are asking, Bob, this is aggregate. How do you know who's committing the crime? You don't, you don't, you don't, you're talking about the rates. You know, what about the ecological fallacy? And I said, very defensively, um, well, I would look at individual stuff, but there's no such crime, um, no such data that would allow me to do this on, on a scale looking at violent crime. And an economist who was on the same panel uh, at ASC, uh, uh, Jeff Grogger, said, oh, Bob, but there is. Um, there's, um, there's uh, the National Longitudinal Surveys of Youth. And the NLSY is a, sur is a national survey about, of about 12,000 people. Uh, and, and that 12,000 uh, people you know, range from 14 uh, to 21. Uh, and uh, it was a longitudinal survey that started collecting in 79. And um, uh, it has lots of good things to it. But the biggest thing was in that first year, they asked about crime. Uh, and so we had enough people that you actually had people engaging in violent crime. It's very skewed, uh, but they're there, and, and that typically is the case. And it has wonderful um, data on, on, on labor market participation because it's funded primarily by the Bureau of Labor Statistics in the U.S. Uh, and so I went to the NLSY and discovered that Jeff sort of had led me right in one respect and led me wrong in another respect, and worked with NLSY as hazardous to one's long-term health because it's very frustrating. <laughs> Uh, but I was able to do this test, and so, uh, so using the, that analog uh, this is this was testing the thesis on individuals uh, um, and, and uh, over over the age of 18, so post high school years. And and again, there are lots of things in the in, in the regression uh, analysis. And I just simply this is one of those simplistic you know slides I'm using in the book to satisfy what you press. Uh, and other things are there, but you know income doesn't matter. But what really jumps out where um, is important. Job duration, you know, all this is, is standardized coefficient. So what's below the zero sort of gives you a sense of, uh, the zero axis gives you a sense of which factors are important uh, and relatively important to the others, and what's above uh, in terms of positive predictors of crime. So job duration um, is significant and it represses involvement in crime. Good primary sector job uh, indicator. But it's out of the labor force that really, start to do. the more time individuals had spent in the last year out of the labor force, the more likely they were to engage in violent crime. Okay, which, again, supported the thesis. Um, but because I'm interested in, I really didn't just do the Seattle analysis because those data were available. I'm really far more interested in the aggregates and those kind of neighborhood patterns and those kind of things that I am an individual. That's, that's where my intellectual you know, passion lies. Um, and one of the nice things about the NLSY is they geocoded the data. And I was you know, able to take all the cases, all 12, it was like 6,000 of the young adults, and then uh, have characteristics of the county in which they live. Now, I know that's not neighborhood, but I'm thinking in terms of county, you know, and how, county, how do So, okay, so in the state of Washington, uh, for, the, for those of you who are less familiar with U.S. sort of organizational things, um, uh, in this state, it's like 39 counties, and so if you think of the state divided up like that. Uh, so, so in, in uh, state size of Queensland, you would probably have, um, 40 or 50, 60 counties. Um, so, so it's local labor market more than anything else. You know, Brisbane would be in one county. Um, 
Um, so it's not neighborhood. I'm not making a neighborhood argument. So, but I used those variables, and I found a significant interaction between time under the labor force and the unemployment rate. Okay, so um, one of my colleagues, uh, Herb Costner, you know, now retired, said, oh, you need to explore that. What's going on? What's, what's, what's the pattern? And so I simply divided the sample in half. Those who lived in counties that were above average unemployment and below average unemployment. And simply said, what effect um, did living in a, in, a, in, a, in a county with high or low unemployment have on things? Um, and here's the results. And so um, the blue line is where high unemployment counties, the red lines are for low unemployment counties. And the critical thing here, the punchline as you look out of the labor market, the blue, um, 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 this is high employment county, I, I misstated that, it's, it's high employment. The labor market effect on crime is insignificant where there's high employment. Individual employment doesn't seem to predict criminality if most people, in, if, if employment's good in that county. The labor market effect shows and is statistically significant in low employment counties. So where there's this situation of other people. So it's not just the individual. This is another complexity that I didn't expect, but I think it's really fascinating. It's not the individual in their work, but it's the individual in the context of others who are marginal to the work, to, to employment that matters. So that's the reason I use that example of not two young guys deciding to go out and drink or not drink, but rather their friends came to them. You need a group of people, you need that critical mass. Uh, and what that tells us is context matters. So it's not just the individual, but it's context that matters as well. Susanna's telling me, giving me the sit down sign, so I don't need to hurry along. So in terms of delinquency, and you know, it was the one I'd sort of been um, sort of troubling over for, you know, for a long time. Uh, and you know, if you think about you know, criminological theory, and it's obvious that if you want to explain delinquency, you don't think about jobs. Because again, in the early literature said kids who work were more likely uh, to engage in, uh, in delinquency, less likely, which is always peculiar because uh, the US government's always fond to say, we're going to deal with delinquency by getting kids after school jobs. And I'm like, no, you know, <laughs> wrong idea. Um, because what we know is school, it's school that matters. It's not employment that matters, it's school that matters. Kids who do well in school are, are far less likely to engage in delinquency than kids who don't do well in school. Control theorists and people from other theoretical you know, uh, leanings have found that for a very long time. But what I have found using actually the children of the NLSY, I mean the, the, the people who run the NLSY have been brilliant. What they started doing is collecting data when the initial NLSY subjects started having children, actually when the women started having children because the guys weren't sure, we didn't know, they didn't know. Uh, so they would follow the children of the women in the early NLSY and they're now the children of the NLSY. And so you could actually follow them. You have, you have information on the mothers, uh, so you have intergenerational information, you have data on the kids and how their experiences. We use the children in the NLSY and some others have done it. Uh, Paul Belair and his colleagues have used the um, adolescent health uh, or at health data to do it, but we're routinely finding that when kids, um, parents, and adults around them are marginal to the labor market, those kids invest less in school. And so labor markets start to have an effect on kids, not directly, but through what happens with their parents. And what I think is happening here is the parents give the same speech that all of us got from our parents. Work hard, go to school, and you'll have a better life. But if those kid parents are marginal to the labor market, you know what the teenager thinks. The teacher just thinks, yeah, like you. And then goes and what the, whatever the heck they want to do. And so I think that that story, that very compelling story that parents like to give, is less compelling if the, if the parents are not doing well. So we found that. We've also found when, when, when adults in the neighborhood uh, aren't uh, working or less out of work, kids do less well in school and their delinquency rates go up. So I've concluded that it's a complex association with working delinquency. It's not as we thought that work increases crime. What we now know from a number of uh, studies is that when kids are good students, when they work, they're even better students and their delinquency doesn't go up. It's, with you, it's, it's the academically oriented kid who when they, when they ha have a job, they have to be even more focused on studies and they tend to do better. So work doesn't hurt them. Or when kids are already bad students, when they work, their delinquency does tend to go up. So it really depends on the school background of a kid before we can decide what happens with employment. And what happens here, we think, is that when students aren't very good students and they work, uh, they're drawn to a group that's slightly older, they have money, that money can get them in trouble in lots of ways, um, and they do less well in school. It pulls them away from school. So work can matter for kids, 
but it depends on how it affects their interconnection to school. But we're also all finding that if, uh, if a child's uh, not in school, they should be working because the worst case scenario is when they're neither working nor in school. So uh, the thing about the analysts, with the children in LSY, and actually all of it now that I learned, was that, um, was that these data are also geocoded to county, but they're also geocoded to census tracts. And census tracts are administrative units, but they're neighborhood-sized uh, administrative units. And so for this analysis of juveniles uh, and for the, uh, 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 a follow-up with, with adults, um, we looked at, um, at the context of neighborhood, too. Um, and in that context, what we find is, is that neighborhoods don't seem to matter for, for adults. You know, it's county that matters for adults. And I think that's because for adults, it's about work and employment, and it's how strong is the local labor market. For kids, because kids are more constrained in their neighborhood, it, you know, their neighborhood seems to matter in terms of their delinquency. And this sort of shows that a little bit. And this is the interaction effect that I, you know, I, said, I told you that I was in trouble with with my um, um, publisher. Um, and we're, we've, what we've done here is we did an interaction between grades and the level of disadvantage in the neighborhood, the census tract in which kids are found. And, and the, the green line is the mean disadvantage, and this is the relationship uh, that we all predict. This is grades, this is delinquency. So as grades go up, delinquency comes down. Uh, just as we've you know, always expected, lots of people have shown. But what's really distressing about this is the red line is low disadvantaged neighborhoods. And those kids give you a more powerful, a protective effect of going to school. But look what happens when we look at, 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 at high disadvantaged tracks. You know, it's virtually flat. Kids in high disadvantaged tracks are not getting protected by doing well in school. And, and, and I found that deeply distressing. Except that the, the sample can be divided into rural sample, metropolitan sample, or central city example. And by central city, I don't mean inner city as in you know my old Pittsburgh, but rather you know um, Brisbane would be the, the central city, and the outlying areas would be would not be here. And for that, we looked at the central city there, and I find this deeply depressing. We, we get we get some uh, attenuation of the effect on for the average tracks, but still trending down. You get, still get a very powerful effect with low, low disadvantage. And this is the one I told people about at the tea we had when, my first week here. In those central city neighborhoods, kids who are getting the better grades are not less likely to delin be delinquent. They're not the same level of delinquency. They're significantly more likely to engage in delinquency. And I don't know why. And I know some of you have been thinking about it, and you're going to give me the answer when we're done here. Um, but essentially, uh, I, I find this one as distressing as anything I've found uh, in, in my life as a criminologist. Because what this is telling me is that school make, isn't going to make the difference in kids in, in, in these disadvantaged neighborhoods. So in my hometown of Pittsburgh, in my hill district that I grew up in Pittsburgh, if I go back there and tell them, make schools better, help kids do better in school, this is the result. So what's the answer? I don't know. So, how and why does work matter? Um, I think work and the quality of work really matters for young adults. It has a direct effect, as I said. It's an indirect effect for kids, so I think that it, it work matters. If you ask me what the policy recommendation would be, it would be don't give kids after school jobs. It's help their parents find quality work. Uh, help the adults around them find quality work and list the family up and it models the right things for, for kids, as, as um, William Julius Wilson and others have said it. Um, I think importantly, employment patterns also affect levels of disadvantage. We get those big disadvantaged communities because so many of the adults are out of work. You've gotten changes in the U.S. with deindustrialization, where you get big swaths of places where there are people out of work. I, mean, I don't go get back to my hill district of my youth very often, but when I was a child there, there were steel workers living there. Steel workers don't exist in Pittsburgh hardly anymore, and so the people who live there are people who are very marginal to the labor force. It's, it's a very different place. It was a scary place when I was a kid. It's much scarier now uh, in, in, in lots and lots of ways. Uh, and so, um, so what's happened is that, that changes, and it's all the structural changes that Wilson and Doug Massey and other people write about uh, and talk about structural disadvantage, and it affects things like education and even lowers a lot of education. But it also does this sort of cultural thing, too, because a lot of people want to sort of say, oh, it's culture that makes a difference. And I think the culture can make some difference, but it follows from these structural disadvantages. And what happens is you get, like Eli Anderson writes about in Philadelphia, when he talks about um, um, 
the codes of the streets. When people are systematically and repeatedly left out and marginalized, uh, oppositional cultures can, de can, can develop. Uh, they take on a life of their own, uh, which encourages people uh, to then have more of a street life. Uh, so uh, what, what, what can we do? Um, what can we do with this circumstance? Um, one, I think it's important that we, um, we uh, uh, realize it's not just employment, it's quality of employment. Um, in doing that, in terms of policy, if somebody wants to know, is there a policy recommendation here? I would say to, to governments, governments are fond of trying to attract employers and people who are going to you know, build by giving tax breaks. And I think they need to ask the question, what kind of jobs are going to create? Um, in the book, I'm not sure they're going to let me do this, but I talk about the Walmart contradiction. And Walmart is the kind of company that comes in and makes big demands from, uh, for, from state and local uh, jurisdictions to put a Walmart there because they're going to bring employment. But Walmart underpays its workers. Uh, and in spite of the commercialization they do, they underbenefit them. There's good research that shows uh, that Walmart is being subsidized in California uh, by the state, by the number of people on state health care, state uh, um, income supports, and those kinds of things. Uh, and what Walmart does is it not only under, undercuts, uh, underserves, underbenefits its own workers, um, but it undercuts the, um, the, uh, the salaries of similarly situated people locally. And so there was a, a strike of grocery workers uh, in Southern California, and it was because the grocers wanted to cut their wages and benefits because the, the grocers needed to be able to compete with Walmart in terms of their pricing. Uh, and so everybody was hurt. So it's, it's the Walmart contradiction, not just because they underpay people, but what they're doing is their market is actually people um, who are in those lower income brackets, and to the extent that they undercut the discretionary income of, of their own workers, they undercut the discretionary income of everybody, which means in the long run they undercut their own profit margin. So I think it's one of those you know, um, long-term problems for them. So I think government needs to look into what kind of jobs are going to be created if we can get the tax break and then hold them accountable. I think we need to worry about quality education and quality education for everybody, but that doesn't solve the problem that I talked about with the inner city. I don't, I don't know how to solve that. Um, but one possibility that someone suggested the other day is maybe the schools are so bad in those neighborhoods that the, the, the good kids simply can go through the motions and get by. Uh, and maybe if we, if we gave them better schools, that, that would turn around. I don't know. Um, we do small fixes. In most American cities, there's a spatial mismatch where people who need the jobs have a hard time getting to where the jobs are. Uh, if I went back to the Seattle map, I would show you where Microsoft is and all those things. And if you're living in the Central District, you can, you can get there, but it takes hours on buses. Um, so deal with the spatial mismatch by making sure mass transit goes with to where the jobs are, not just where people want to go. So think about Walter. We can think about small fixes or big fixes and all those things. So the Walters of the world are people who Walter didn't want to work. We need to find ways to motivate the Walters. I'm not trying to do that. The hole in the wall gangs, we need to motivate their parents and make sure their parents have something good. Otherwise, these kids are going to be marginal to, to, to school, they're going to be marginal to all those things, and they're going to find things like barns to break into to entertain themselves. The Robbie Weidemans are the people who, are, who really, really can have an effect because they want a better life than they're going to get. Now, John, his older brother, was able to build a good life coming out of the inner city Pittsburgh neighborhood they grew up in. Robbie wanted more than he could get coming out of there because the neighborhood had changed. And so it's the Robbie Weidemans, if we come up with good primary sector jobs, that you're going you're to get. You know, Robbie probably isn't going to think that he wants to go to Boeing, but when he thinks that the, the, the alternative is Mackers, he's going to rip off, um, he's going to rip off uh, 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 fences. But if you give him that, that, that it's better opportunities, that's where we can intercede and we can make a difference. And I just will finish with, uh, the question of, you know, somewhere in Australia, uh, are there, there are people without quality jobs and with poor education. The question is where they are. And I would finish with the notion of saying, I'm convinced it's not just those people's situation, but the context in which they find themselves. Now, I'll be happy to take your questions.